I haven't gone live, that's why. Hi, my name is Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So today we will be talking toroidal models of the electron and proton. Can you hear me, Tony Jaboni, Corky Goss, Terran Art? Can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so when I posted this uh, image that you see here on the screen earlier today, in fact, um, about uh, 40 minutes ago, Hank Kieran said that, uh, he said, oh, that's a nice sort of uh, image of what might have interacted with the copper pipe, the 15 millimeter ball burn or ball lightning cut in his Vega experiment. And I said, yes, of course, it's a synthetic image, but we've actually shared images that look remarkably like this. And they're already public. There is many more images. And in fact, some of them are of higher fidelity, but the ones I'm gonna show you now were already shared a good few moons ago. And here is one of them, and it's actually on this much larger image. And this is where Hank Uren was producing ball lightnings out of a tube, which we will talk about later. And they were detaching from the tube, moving towards this sheath, which is of fused quartz, and they were colliding with it. And behind this sheath was the anode. So there was kind of some sort of vector in there that was driving it. And sometimes you got these very geometric structures here, with the balls around a central spot. But more often than not, you get these kind of structures. Now it's still got a geometrical structure. And as we know, um, when the structures eat in the boundary layers between uh, copper grains, in those ball lightning cuts in the uh, copper pipe, they actually produce these geometric structures in there as they are consuming the material. So. It, it, it does make sense that they would have this geometric nature. Now, the way I'm reading these kind of ones is that the spherical structure, which has some hollowness to it, has collided here. And if you can imagine you've got a ball and the ball collapses down onto this court surface, which is ostensibly mostly flat, uh, reference to the ball that's hitting it, then on the outside, you've got like a Fresnel effect where you have more of this kind of worm-like structure interacting with the, the fused quartz, and you have less here where it's hollow, okay? And then there's something going on in the middle. So I see these as kind of geodesic uh, uh, spherical structures. Here's one that um, we, we know and love where it collided with the structure, but side on, but this is a toroidal structure. Now, I'll talk about this in another presentation where I believe that the collapse of cavitation bubbles are doing something similar and it will shoot out a beam, but um, we've talked about that a number of times. Uh, I, there's some other examples here. So in this case, again, this is a spherical structure in my view with a hollow shell, and what you're seeing is a, a density around this edge where, we, where you've got a lot of impacting worms or these magnetic flux tubes then you've got a little bit less and then you've got the hollow bit in the center and you only get a little bit of effect because you've just got a, a little bit of the surface interacting with it there's many many examples of these strike marks okay but then there are some toroidal ones and i believe that this is a toroidal structure and again around that rim where the ball lightning cut out the copper pipe we had um, a toroidal one, which again was uh, uh, had this iron-rich crenellated structure on the outside with these little uh, kind of uh, vortex pair structures coming off them as tendrils. But in this case, the reason I'm saying this is a, 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 tor a torus is because there's absolutely no damage whatsoever in this central section. Okay, So this, to me, is more like the ones that we saw um, uh, in a different place on that cut and it may actually be the case that this is also a torus here but uh, I, when I share the full data set of these there are many examples and they're actually at a much higher resolution than is even presented here and when you go into them you actually see that they are comprised of little tori and sometimes it's quite clear that they are tori in rings 
Um, uh, and sometimes that you you can see is this a it, this is a bunch of clumps of stru structures around. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot to be thought about when this data, more of this data is shared uh, for analysis. Now um, here is one on the the uh, kind of like the the map of the the pyramid, and you can see here there's this central section. This is a pillar, and then you have this area around here. So anyway, those are the kind of things, but. Where, where, where did this journey start from? Well, one could argue that it started from the work of Winston Bostick. And this is, I think, his 1957 paper, 1956. And he did these electrical discharges. This was deuterated uh, titanium. This is a ceramic. He did these electrical pulses. It produced a flux loop between those. And um, as one can imagine, if you've got a, a, a current loop going through this plasma, then you will have this... Uh, magnetic field going around it and what happened was as it came off and that's just uh th this jumping about sorry about that um there was a magnetic reconnection on the end here and it produced this uh torus structure so straight away you've got uh, an electrical current going around here and you've got this uh, uh what now is rather than just a, the magnetic field going around a wire let's say it's actually like a poloidal structure and when these things interact they kind of deflect from each other depending on which direction they're coming from and the, the experts that uh, hopefully andras might talk a little bit more about this but one of the things we saw in uh, david butlier's experiments coming out of a ball lightning when it broke down is a plasmoid structure similar to this in, in fact extremely exactly similar to this and so we have replicated these kind of effects now these are actually hypotheses, and he's very clear that these are hypotheses for how these occur. And you can imagine that if this is open-ended and they come and twist together, you might get something like this. Or if you have two, two tori coming together, they tended to orbit around each other. And Bostick went on to do uh, discharges on like a, uh, a, a hexagon-shaped uh, cathode, and this produced down its length a series of um, these structures where you had these uh, vortex anti vortex pairs and if you look at them in this diagram which we we spoke about before um, this is actually in uh, uh, Murray B King's book and they're saying that this might be considered as polarization of the vacuum and you've got a left hand uh, uh, rotation and a right right hand rotation so it produces a pair on one side and these come together and they come to a pinch point here and this is actually the basis of uh, LPP's fusion model uh, and it comes together in what they call a little a little plasmoid bundle here and they argue that there's some neutrons being formed or, or something uh, from the process that's going on in the particular experiment that's there well no, um, Bostick continued to do this uh, fusion type di directed research uh, until about 1980 and this is a paper with Bart uh, um, Nardi and in this particular image here this is where the so-called D4D ratio came from uh, according to their work and in their impact marks here you see this uh, toroidal structure with spokes around it okay and I think this is very, very interesting. And uh, this was one of the indicators, uh, along with uh, the work of Ken Shoulders, saying these multiple toroidal structures without ever drawing what they look like, and saying that they are um, like electrons and they can have a go down to a charge of minus one, but they, they can be fantastic numbers of electrons in there, stabilized by uh, one in uh, 10,000. Uh, electrons one iron in 10,000 electrons and they stabilize the structure because if you'll be aware that normal exotic vacuum objects they they fall apart um uh sorry no, normal heavy electrons like a, a, a muon or a tauon they have very short half li uh, half lives they, they well they just decay quite quickly whereas an evo relatively relatively lasts for a very long time and so something has to keep them stable and you know one can argue what that might be but when i saw these various things that led me uh, uh, i had that in my context and when i saw these things on the hutchison uh, fracture sample that led to a, a fractal model of 
um, the exotic vacuum object, which because it's meant to be basically a cluster of electrons, the assumption is that the electron is like that in a self-similar way. And because uh, Nard, uh, uh, because um, uh, Bostick had said in, the 19, in 1957 in his public addresses that these things could be all the way down to subatomic particles and all the way up to uh, galactic objects, uh, I was of the mind to take him seriously and say that this could be a way that the, the universe is structured. And the other, the other thing which we're going to be talking about a little bit today um, is the Aronhoff uh, bomb effect, uh, or rather the equations. Um, perhaps that will be addressed, I don't know. But uh, I will be talking about that in my presentation in ICCF 25 in Poland. And if I can go to this actual link here, rather than it just allowing me to edit it. No, it's not going <laughs> to go to the bookmark. OK, it's not going to do that. Um, down here in this uh, paper by, um, it's by Afanasyev and Dubovic. And I have, I have to say again, Dubovic is really at death's door right now. It's a real shame that we're going to lose him uh, at this time when so much is being found and discovered of his work. But down here, there's something that I think is very, very interesting here. Um, what they're doing is there, there's a screen here and there's a, a, a beam of electrons and we have our fractal toroidal structure here. And it's saying here, the magnetic time dependent Aronhoff bomb effect. For the charge current configuration discussed in the text, the time-dependent magnetic flux differs from zero only inside the impenetrable torus T. Outside T, uh, the independent of time electric strength E differs from zero only inside the torus hole. Uh, it is the time-dependent magnetic flux inside T that leads to the time variation of the intensity of the scattered charged particles, right? So anyway, we've got charged particles coming in here and they are scattered. And you can see that there seems to be a concentration in the center. And this is, um, it, it might not make sense now, but this is why I believe that uh, you get these things like was observed by Slobodan Stankovic, by Klimov, and when you're using uh, HHO to cut through very thick, like 50 centimeters of steel. Um, and I will, I will talk about all of these things uh, later time, but it, to, to my mind, it is partly to do with this and partly to do with the fact that the AB effect helps the coherence of the matter um, that it, uh, and in this case, it's electrons uh, uh, to form a coherent matter wave. So um, uh, I don't know whether Pavel will be able to join us, um, but uh, he has this model of both an electron and uh, a, a proton. The electron is a fractal toroidal structure, and it's very specifically a fractal toroidal structure of toroids. The, the model of the proton uh, is actually a fractal coil, like we've spoken about in the bagel game. So I hope he'll be able to speak to us on his where he got his inspiration from. And his inspiration was from, I think, 2007 or 2008. Um, but he's not the only one. There are many scientists out there, uh, a lot of Russian scientists, and I have other papers from those. And I was given one in California before I introduce uh, Andras Kovacs. Uh, and I've got it over here, so I'm just going to wave it. I don't know whether you can see, but um, it's by a guy called... Uh, and I had his name earlier, somewhere here, uh, by James Carter. It's from 1993. Here you go. And it has a whole periodic table. It's a whole periodic table of toroidal atom structures. And this is exactly what Pavel Asmir has done. He's actually got a toroidal uh, uh, model for, for kids to learn how, how these structures go together. But on the bottom here, there is, in this particular example here, uh, there is a torus. I don't know if you can see because my camera's in the way. This one here, there at the bottom. And that, in fact, that, in fact, is a coil of a coil of a coil of a coil structure. And that was in 1993. So when the Russians were doing this, this was also being thought about in America. So, um, 
Yeah, so you're not seeing the camera image. Okay, so for, for those on YouTube, So, um, firstly, I'd like to introduce Andres Kovacs. Andres Kovacs is a uh, Hungarian. He, he, he was born, I think, near uh, where I am um, currently right now. And I will switch the screens around so people can see you on YouTube. Uh, give me a second. Quick that one. Uh, and all. And he is working with one, uh, Giorgio Vassallo, who actually, thank you, Giorgio. He was one of our thousand, first $1,000 thousand donor, donors in 2012, I believe. So, uh, and, and I'm not doing this because of that. Um, he's been a follower right from the beginning and uh, contributed at key points. And now he's been working, uh, producing a book with Francesco Cellani, you might remember uh, from our early replications in 2012 and 2013, the wonderful Francesco Cellani, the first Lena scientist to seriously allow someone else to test his work, and thank God he did. Uh, and uh, and he's then actually now working together. Andres, is that right? And so, yes. Andres, can you give a little bit about your history um, and uh, what, why you're interested in this field? And then it's you've got the floor. All right. So I have been uh, studying uh, physics at university, and at that time I thought I will be a physicist. But then, uh, you know, life have decided otherwise. So I uh, was doing uh, other works, and uh, after a big detour, now I'm uh, returning to physics. But uh, I'm not in uh, at any university or research institute. So I'm in a, a lucky position that I can uh, choose myself, you know, what I would uh, like to study and what I'm interested in doing. And um, I have been interested uh, uh, firstly to, to replicate the Parhomov's reactor. So when I, when I read about Parhomov's reactor, I thought, well, well, this looks a simple enough experiment. So, so then uh, with some colleagues, we thought, well, we can, we can do this. So let's see if it works. And, and the part of replication has been my entry into LNR. Uh, we could not uh, uh, replicate uh, what, what Parhomov has uh, uh, found, uh, but we, we saw other um, uh, strange uh, phenomena in that type of reactor, uh, including elevated Geiger counter readings. And well, elevated Geiger counter readings it certainly sounds like like nuclear. Uh, so, so then uh, you know I have been interested to understand you know what is what is really going on here, and um, uh, then Francesco Cellani introduced me to Giorgio Vassallo, and uh, I saw that uh, he's he's the, he's a genius, and I have been inspired to work together with him, and and uh, that has has led to writing the book together. So the the name of the book is. Uh, it's a unified field theory and Occam's razor, but I will I will have a slide about it in my okay. presentation. And and this act, this bit that you're going to share tonight isn't actually in the first edition of that book, is it? Uh, the the part about electrons is so so everything that I say about electrons uh, is in the book, and then uh, I will have a part about the protons. Uh, the uh, the proton part is is brand new, so that's not in the book, but it is in an open source. Uh, uh, or meaning an open uh, article, so anybody can read about what you write in the, about the proton. Okay, fantastic. So do you have anything to add before going ahead with the presentation? All right, so I share my screen. Okay. There, so do you, do you see my screen? I do, it's lovely. All right, great. So, so I will be talking about the results of our work uh, that um, led us to the toroidal models of the electron and proton 
so this has been mainly my work with uh, Giorgio Vassallo, uh, but uh, the other co-authors uh, with whom we have been working are also listed here. So uh, I would like to begin uh, with a history lesson, a uh, little bit similar to how you did. It's important to, to set the context. And uh, uh, I will start with electromagnetism uh, theory development uh, to really understand what are the historic trends and from where we are going, where we are heading to. So, so the history of electromagnetism it really goes back to 1850s. Uh, Michael Faraday has been the first to develop the intuition about electromagnetic fields, and he has been the first, as far as I know, to formulate the electromagnetic nature of light. But he could not put it into equations. Uh, uh, well, the first one who put it into equations is James Maxwell, who introduced the equations now named after him. But the version that we learn in school has been actually written down in 1884 by Oliver Heaviside. So he organized uh, Maxwell equations into four vectorial uh, equations. And um, what Oliver Heaviside wrote down is basically what I have learned in high school. And if uh, somebody's physics career ends in high school, then uh, this uh, Heaviside equations is what you're really learning. Now, in these equations, uh, what is important to uh, keep in mind is that charges, they remain as an external objects uh, put into the equations by hand. In other words, the equations themselves do not tell you what charges are made of. Okay, then next step in this theory development happened at the turn of 20th century. Uh, Linard and Wichert developed a formulation starting from the for potential, this is a vector object. And then the electric and magnetic fields are derived from this for potential object. So this approach allows one to write Maxwell's equation as a single equation. So that's quite a good step forward. Now we have only one equation that describes all of electromagnetism. And this is the formulation that I have learned at university. And uh, today, I believe still, uh, physics students learn this uh, uh, 120 years old uh, formulation of electromagnetism. Now, all of this that I told up to now uh, has been a fringe theory when it was formulated. So these, uh, these people, it's been a small community. They have been interested to work together. So this is important, but uh, the famous and respectable scientists uh, did not teach electromagnetism at that time. Uh, sometimes they just mentioned it in passing as an interesting hypothesis. Mm, because, you know, at that time, uh, the ether particles was older age. And <laughs> self-respecting physicists of the 19th century So that uh, what you have to do is to study ether particles. So it uh, actually was only around 1910, 1920. Uh, when radio engineers uh, started using Maxwell's equations. And then it had to go mainstream because, you know, once it's commercial, once engineers are using it, you know, the, uh, the physics community has to follow uh, suit. And uh, this, I think, for our community is also an uh, important um, uh, inspiration that this is really how big innovations happen. First, it's a fringe community. There is a useful application. And, and then it goes mainstream. That's, I think, is the usual, usual way. Uh, now, once uh, this uh, electromagnetism theory went mainstream uh, around 1920s, it was then considered to be a closed and completed chapter in physics. And you know, pretty much uh, we learn uh, today still the same way about electromagnetism, how it was then codified in the, in the 1920s. Okay, question, has there anything that happened since then? Uh, well, there, there actually has been a few things. So let's uh, look now at the further development uh, since the 1920s. Um, there have been uh, two important uh, uh, steps forward that happened in 1950s. First, what you can see on the left side is Hungarian mathematician Marcel Ries apply the Clifford algebra to study electromagnetism. And uh, it takes some learning to get familiar with geometric algebra, 
but it's it's not that impossible. I I'm lucky that I have a colleague who is a mathematician, and I asked him, "Can you explain me Clifford algebras?" And he was explaining quite well in two hours. So that so that I believe if you have a mathematician friend, and uh, you know you invest a few hours, you can you can learn about Clifford algebras. It's not impossible. And the point is that once you you learn it, you can um, work with a formulation that is very well suited to uh, describe space time events, and then you don't get lost in notation of big you know vector matrices, but you will you know sharply see the dynamics without getting lost in the notation. That's that's the point there. <clears throat> and then uh, Reese's work has been uh, further. Um, uh, elaborated by David Hesteness, uh, Lonesto, and many other mathematicians. So this is really a, a growing trend that's uh, now reaching critical mass to apply a Clifford algebra to describe electromagnetism. Okay, the other important event in 1950s is that a physicist, uh, I think he was American physicist called Moses, uh, attempted to formulate electromagnetism as a pure field theory meaning that he wanted to work with field objects that incorporate both charges and electromagnetic fields so that charges would not be somehow separate and external uh, from the theory. And uh, well, he had uh, some success, but uh, did not become mainstream. Uh, but what did become uh, quite popular uh, starting from 2000 is to study longitudinal or scalar electromagnetic waves. And I think your audience is quite well aware of uh, some of these names. And there is again a growing community that uh, does believe both on theoretic and experimental grounds that there are longitudinal and scalar electromagnetic waves. Now to do this theory of uh, scalar waves, one can do it either complicated or simple way. Complicated ways to make Maxwell's equations more, more complicated with extra objects. Simple ways to make them more simple. And uh, all of these uh, developments, I believe, kind of culminated in around 2017. So two Italian gentlemen, Giuliano Bettini and my co-author, Giorgio Vassallo, uh, have developed the simplest formulation of Maxwell's equation that you can see here on the screen. And uh, they developed this formulation uh, using all of the uh, above mentioned uh, trends and I think that's a really important step forward when you have a decades long development and that results in, in a much simpler understanding of, of electromagnetic theory. So let's see what this simple equation really says. The, this A with the square is the uh, four potential vector. The square uh, uh, signifies that it's a vector in the four dimensional space time. And uh, the sigma is just the space-time derivative, but this uh, multiplication between them is the Clifford multiplication. Clifford multiplication, you can you know, read about it in our works, is the proper way to do the multiplication in, in space-time algebra. So this is a very compact notation, oh, sorry. So what this notation really says here is that if you have the uh, four potential uh, object, which is the fundamental object of electromagnetism, you take its space-time derivative, you have the electromagnetic field, that's G. This electromagnetic field incorporates electric field, magnetic field, and scalar fields. There are you know, all three types. And then you take the space-time derivative of this uh, electromagnetic field G, and you get zero. And, and, and that's it. So it's, uh, it's simple enough. Okay, is it uh, oversimplified or is it the, the real uh, essence of electromagnetism? So we believe uh, that, that there is no oversimplification here. You know, there is no need why nature should be more complex, uh, needlessly complex. This uh, simple equation is in fact the, the essence of electromagnetism, but uh, <clears throat> uh, the simplicity in a way uh, then allows many different solutions because simple equation doesn't mean one solution. A simple equation can uh, uh, host uh, many uh, solutions, some of them which we didn't know about before. So, so here, uh, 
uh, I, I listed some important consequences of this simple equation. So the first consequence is that the electric and magnetic charges are no more external objects to Maxwell equation, but they are an integral part of the electromagnetic field. So this is, I think, philosophically very important because for the first time we can answer what electromagnetic, what electric and magnetic charges are made of, and they are made of the electromagnetic field itself. So in that sense, this formulation completes the Moses program, and um, uh, these um, uh, charges they are related to the scalar field um, that's described in our work. Uh, what also follows from this, you can see that this is a, a wave equation type formulation. So what uh, follows is that both fields and charges are somehow part of an electromagnetic wave. And these waves always move at the scale, speed of light, which means that all electric charges move at the speed of light. So the electron that looks to us this slow particle is in fact moving at a speed of light, but this fast moving of speed of light is called Zitterbewegung. And that's again not a new idea. Schrödinger and Dirac have, have recognized this idea already, uh, but <clears throat> it has been uh, challenging for them to put it into equations. And this now directly follows from this Maxwell formulation. Uh, the other uh, consequence is that longitudinal scalar waves now become a trivial solution of Maxwell's equation. And I had um, some lecture about that earlier. I think it's posted on your channel so people can look it up. And um, then that uh, again shows that to describe longitudinal waves, we don't have to add any complication. It's just a trivial solution, just like transversal wave is a trivial solution. Now, now, of course, uh, every wave behaves very differently depending on its wavelengths. So if you have an ordinary transversal wave, uh, if it has long wavelengths and radio wave, it becomes very different than if it has short wavelengths and, uh, and it's a gamma wave, right? So one passes through walls, uh, other one reflects from metal objects, and they have need different type of sensors to detect, and everything is different. And, and it's the same for longitudinal wave, and uh, the low frequency and high frequency ones behave differently. And I came to the conclusion that uh, uh, what physicists call a high frequency wave, uh, no, sorry, what physicists call a neutrino is in fact a high frequency longitudinal wave. <laughs> so that's uh, that's my perspective. And again, if someone's interested about the details, we describe in a book uh, how I came to this uh, conclusion and. And you know, keep in mind that so far, all neutrino measurements show it traveling at the speed of light. There has never been any neutrino detection slower than, than the speed of light. Uh, <clears throat> all right, but let's, let's focus on our subject of today. So this is the uh, foundation somehow to uh, what we will use. Uh, and with this foundation, we'll try to understand better what the electron and proton are, are made of. And, uh, and I, I strongly believe that once we are successful and once there is engineering applications, then this will become mainstream in electromagnetism. So maybe hundred years from now, uh, this is the type of electromagnetism that people will learn at university. Now, the, the other uh, thread that comes into my presentation that's very important is the article which uh, Bob has translated, the Bagel game article, this has been introduced in your previous um, uh, videos. So this uh, article describes an experiment uh, that creates a persistent electromagnetic structure. So what you see in that experiment is a kind of a torus upon torus upon torus structure of uh, the electromagnetic wire, of electric wire that you can see there. And then by uh, applying uh, AC current into that, uh, interestingly coiled um, multi-torus uh, wire. One gets this uh, electromagnetic field configuration illustrated at the bottom uh, left. And in this configuration, electric and magnetic fields induce each other in an interesting way. Uh, and uh, this induction is persistent so that 
if you turn off the current source, there is a persistent uh, electromagnetic field that stays there. Okay, big question. Uh, did uh, the people doing this experiment create a particle? Uh, well, it, this uh, electromagnetic object, it certainly has energy. And if it has energy, it has a corresponding mass equals uh, mc squared. So in, in many ways, this fulfills the definition of a particle, but <clears throat> they use a very low frequency and they did not have uh, uh, to choose very particular sizes. So it means that in the low frequency region, if this is a particle, there are infinitely many particles, perhaps. And, and then the quantized particle masses that we are familiar with, they only appear in the very high frequency region and we will see the electron frequency a bit uh, later on. So, so if this uh, we can think of as a particle, okay, this is very interesting because uh, we can understand its electromagnetic structure. We can uh, uh, calculate for Maxwell's equation how induction happens inside. So if uh, a particle has electromagnetic structure, can we apply the same approach to the electron to somehow find out what is its electromagnetic structure. And this, this actually has been a long-standing desire in physics. We are not the first with this idea. So already Feynman had this quote, which I will now read. Uh, Many attempts have been made and some of the theories were even able to arrange things so that all the electron mass was electromagnetic, but all of these theories have died. So, so this uh, approach is a, is a graveyard of <laughs> theories, we can say, but we are not uh, discouraged by these failed attempts, but we try to learn from past mistakes. Uh, so with this inspiration of the bagel game experiment, let's see uh, what we can say about the electron. Now, when uh, we describe a physical object uh, it is important to, to base uh, our description on, on actual physical measurements and experiments. And unfortunately, there are very good measurements that uh, tell us exactly how big the electron is. Uh, however, what is confusing is that these measurements give a very different size for the electron depending on the type of measurement. So the first measurement we can use to uh, get the electron size is the Compton scattering type of measurements. So Compton scattering measures the radius of a spherical charge, and uh, this can be calculated according to the klein nishina formula. So the experimental results from Compton scattering experiments is that this electron has a spherical charge with 2.82 femtometer radius. And uh, this is called in physics, the classic electron radius. Okay, so this uh, Compton scattering is done with very high frequency uh, waves, but you can do another type of scattering experiment with low frequency waves, and this is called Thomson scattering. When you apply low frequency waves, you are measuring the whole radius of the electron structure, and the experimental result here gives 386 femtometers. In physics, this is called the reduced Compton radius. So I illustrated it here with this RE radius. So, so somehow the spherical charge is moving inside this much uh, bigger electron structure. And then finally, uh, we know that the electron uh, spreads in a wave function and this uh, spreading in a wave function is according to Heisenberg uncertainty. And uh, uh, the most uh, studied uh, spreading of the wave function is in the atomic orbitals. And the experimental result for a ground state with elementary charges, one positive, one, one negative, is the well-known Bohr radius, which is 52.9 uh, picometers. So we can consider these three different measurements give three completely different electron sizes. Well, wow, that's uh, confusing, but there is a very amazing relationship between them. So if you look at the ratio of the uh, classic electron radius and Compton radius, the ratio is alpha, where alpha is the fine structure constant. And again, you look at the ratio of the Bohr radius and reduced Compton radius, 
you again get this uh, alpha uh, uh, ratio. So it's uh, some kind of a geometric structure, and uh, and uh, that's that's not a coincidence, right? So so we have to understand, you know, what what does nature really do when it creates this embedded geometry of uh, very different uh, sizes, and uh, <clears throat> this alpha is what in physics is called a fine structure constant. It's approximately one over one thirty seven. So from this. Um, uh, picture you can understand why many physicists have been obsessed with this number 137 over the past uh, 100 years. Okay, <clears throat> now now it's important that when we describe the electron, we we base ourselves on these numbers because as long as we want to describe reality, these numbers give the boundary condition. So if you talk about something completely outside of this boundary condition, you're not talking about physics. So, so to put it bluntly, you know, there are many particle physicists who say that the electron is an infinitely small abstract point. Well, that doesn't have any relation to these numbers. So that's not physics as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, so what we'll do is uh, uh, keeping with these real measurements and we try to understand how an electromagnetic structure uh, conforms to these numbers. So uh, if we imagine that the electron is an electromagnetic structure, then there must be electrical and magnetic fields that induce each other within the electron, the same as with the bagel game experiment. Okay, a charged object has electric energy lines around it and corresponding electric energy density. Okay, there is a well-known formula. You take the square of the electric field and uh, multiply by dielectric constant over two. So we get these uh, numbers uh, from, uh, from Maxwell equation and electric field goes down as one over R square. Then you square it, the density goes down as one over R cube. And uh, to get the total electric energy, we have to integrate this density from infinity all the way down to the radius of this uh, square, uh, sorry, of this sphere. So here is this uh, integral, uh, radial integral of the electric energy density. So this is quite straightforward mass. I, I think people can verify this as a homework that this calculation is correct. So uh, when you multiply it down to a radius R0, then putting in the uh, classical electron radius, this one value that I mentioned was measured by Compton scattering, we see an amazing result. We see that the electric field is exactly half of the electron mass, exactly half, amazing, right? So this, <clears throat> this gives then the physical meaning of the electron charge radius, that the electron charge radius is this real uh, physical quantity and the electric charge is distributed over the sphere and the corresponding electric energy is half of the electron mass. Now, we remember that uh, every charge moves at the speed of light. So we take a model where we have a circular zeta bewegung around this circle. And then we can calculate the corresponding magnetic energy of this uh, current from the current loop formula. So the current loop formula is that the magnetic energy is one half times magnetic flux uh, times uh, the current. So the magnetic flux is quantized to H over E and uh, the current you can calculate from the uh, light speed motion of this charge and you get this uh, formula. So now into this formula, uh, again, quite straightforward calculation, we put in this uh, reduced quantum radius that was measured by Thomson scattering. And again, amazing, the magnetic energy is exactly half of the electron mass. Uh, so now we get the physical meaning of reduced quantum radius. It's the radius of the electron zeta bevego. Okay, we put together uh, the electric and magnetic energy and together we get, they give the 
total mass of the electron. So, so this means that uh, the electron is in fact electromagnetic field where electric and magnetic field induces each other and electromass is just electromagnetic energy. So, so, so electron is trapped light to put colloquially, colloquially and we are all the children of the light to put it a bit poetically. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so this uh, I think is a very important result. What is also uh, you can see here is that in both electric and magnetic formulas, there is a dependence of one over R. So it means that the energies are inversely proportional to the radius. So it means that the more you shrink down the particle, the mass grows correspondingly. So heavy particles are really small, light particles are large. So let's keep it in mind. It will be important later for the proton. Uh, okay, now here this picture is a static snapshot, but I you know, told you that electric and magnetic uh, fields yeah. induce each other. And in fact, you can think of an electron as an LC circuit. So the inductance L, we use the usual formula of, uh, of flux over current. This is the inductance formula for a current loop. And we get this inductance value. Uh, we can calculate the capacitance also from the usual capacitor formula of charge over potential. And the potential we can calculate from the size of the charge sphere. And we get this value. And for an LC circuit, the frequency is one over square root LC. So the uh, electromagnetic frequency of the electron is this value. It's about 10 to the 20 Hertz, quite, quite fast frequency. Now, in 1924, De Broly had this uh, hypothesis that every particle has an internal frequency proportional to its mass. So this uh, De Broly's formula is that um, H times his frequency is the MC square. And if a positron and electron annihilates, then the resulting electromagnetic radiation indeed has this uh, frequency. And amazingly, this uh, frequency, which De Broly had this formula for, and which we can see in electron positron annihilation is, is exactly this number, which uh, is the frequency of the LC circuit. Uh, so, so this um, again, uh, demonstrates that we are seemingly on the right path. The electron's internal frequency, which physics is called De Broly frequency, is nothing else than its electromagnetic oscillation frequency. So, so you can see that uh, we are getting towards the bagel game. Now, uh, a question, is this uh, toroidal so far? Well, if, uh, if we think of the circular motion, okay, that's just a circle, uh, but uh, if uh, we think of the electron having a size, then then this uh, sphere moves in, in a toroidal volume. So that is, in that sense, the electron Zitterbewegung is a toroidal uh, structure. But there is uh, more to it, because if we consider wave particle uh, duality, uh, then we know that uh, the electron wave uh, somehow has an orbital motion when it's uh, in an atom. Uh, in other words, this picture I showed you here is the picture in the rest frame of the particle. This you see when you move together with the electron. But if you are observing from the lab and you see the electron moving, then this uh, circle really becomes like a, a spiral. And in case of atomic orbital, the spiral becomes a closed uh, uh, torus. So, uh, so coming back to this uh, toroidal model, if we consider the Bohr orbit model uh, and we consider this orbital motion of the electron in the Bohr orbit, which is a stable state of the electron, then, then we have a two-tor structure in the language of the Bagel game article. We have this internal Zitterbewegung loop uh, that, and the bigger orbital loop. So, so very well, we can see that uh, the electron has a, has a two-tor structure in the, in the hydrogen orbit. Uh, 
of course, one could say that, yeah, it's more complicated because the Bohr orbit is a simplification. There is a, a radial standing wave. Yeah, okay, there is a, it's in that sense a more complicated object. Uh, but the point is that we seem to be on the right track here and uh, we can make the model more elaborate by also considering the radial standing wave. Uh, but anyhow, whether you consider it or not, uh, the Bohr orbit, the simple Bohr orbit already gives you the correct energy levels of the, of the hydrogen atom. Uh, <clears throat> what else uh, is important? Uh, that uh, we can also understand right away what is the electron spin. Because uh, when you have the zeta vagal motion, then it has the associated magnetic moment, and uh, the electron uh, spin is nothing else but the magnetic moment that's associated with this zeta vagal motion. So, so we can very precisely understand what the electron spin really means. Uh, also, we can understand quite well uh, what is the uh, wave function of the electron. So, when you have from the rest frame, the zeta vagal motion, that's an oscillation in time. When the electron moves, then you have a Lorentz transformation into a different frame. And as you know, Lorentz transformation is uh, mixing time and space components according uh, to this Lorentz uh, boost rotation. And the phase of the wave function is just the Lorentz transformed component of the zeta vagal phase. So once you understand zeta vagal and Lorentz transformation, you can automatically calculate and understand what the wave function really is. And uh, I think this is, uh, in that sense, important that once we go into this direction, then quantum mechanics becomes understandable because when I learned quantum mechanics at university, we started with postulates, you learn that this, 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 and this postulate is the basis, and then you calculate things from those postulates but you don't know where those postulates come from. But now we have a chance to derive those postulates and really understand the meaning behind quantum mechanics. Uh, so, so in that sense, we can explore not only the electron's internal structure, but also the meaning of the quantum mechanical wave function. So this is in essence what our toroidal electron model is. And uh, now, I just list here some related works. So if somebody is interested to uh, learn more about our electron model, we have this book uh, published with World Scientific called Unified Field Theory and Occam's Razor. You can see its, uh, its cover. And uh, basically it goes into more detail on all of these topics, what I described up to now. In addition, we give an understandable explanation to spinners which as a university student, I could never understand, but now you can. Uh, Pauli exclusion principle, Aharonov bomb relations, and uh, longitudinal waves. Also, I have a video tutorial, quantum mechanics introduction. So if you uh, search this in YouTube, uh, together with my name, you will um, see the video and you will have there a derivation of Schrodinger equation uh, about quantum mechanical wave, and importantly about single frequency emission in quantum mechanical transitions. So, so uh, when you have a transition between two quantum mechanical states, let's say two stable states of the electron, uh, those transitions always generate single frequency waves. And this has been the inspiration of the so-called photons. And uh, that has been also a hundred years of uh, uncertainty how to really understand photons. I think if you look, if you are patient enough and look this video to the end, you could have a chance to understand the photons as well a bit. Uh, okay, so this uh, about the toroidal structure of the electron. Uh, I think I will take questions at the end, but now I will move on to the proton. And uh, the big question is that once we have this interesting structure of the electron, can we apply the same to the proton? Well, let's, uh, let's start from the same uh, uh, principles. First, let's clarify what is the proton size. And again, we use the same method. We firstly consider what do Compton scattering 
say about the spherical proton size. And here I have um, experimental data of the quantum uh, scattering radius. And this is a function of the uh, frequency. Now here, the situation is a bit more complicated than, uh, than in the electron case, because at these high frequencies, you have also particle pair production that gives extra uh, scattering amplitude. So for example, this peak is well recognized as the pion production peak. Okay, but we are not interested in pion production, we're interested in the uh, actual proton size. So we have to look at the low frequency part of this chart before the uh, pion production. And here you can see on the chart that if the proton was, for example, uh, 0.005 femtometer, then this would uh, give a too large uh, radius with respect to experimental data. Now, when if we demand that experimental data is well converging to the uh, to the klein nishina formula, then the actual proton spherical radius size, uh, the charge radius size comes out to be 0 0.0015 femtometer, very, very small value. And now uh, I would like to note that, that this is not uh, mainstream interpretation. This is our interpretation of these experimental data, but I think it's a very direct interpretation. You take quantum scattering at this region, apply klein nishina formula, and you get the spherical charge radius. Uh, what is mainstream is the mean radius of the proton structure. And there are two methods to determine it, the scattering and spectroscopy. Here you can see the scattering distribution based on JLab data. So somewhere in this region is where the proton structure is located. So this looks a bit like a cross section of a torus. And uh, both of these scattering and spectroscopy methods give about the same uh, proton radius. This is what the physics literature calls the in quotes proton radius, the 0 0.84 femtometer. Okay, so we are trying to understand the proton as a structure that has the mean radius of 0 0.82 femtometer within which this very small spherical ball is moving around. Uh, all right, now a logical question to ask. Uh, is the proton just a scaled down positron? No. Uh, for example, it's well known that the muon can be imagined as a scaled electron. Can we do the same with the proton? Uh, the proton positron mass ratio is 1836, about that. And as I uh, showed you in previous slides, with all else being equal, the particle size is in inverse proportion to particle mass. So from this mass ratio, okay, let's calculate what the scaled proton size should be. The uh, radius of its charge is actually well matching experimental data. Okay, it's good. The toroidal radius should be 0 0.21 femtometer. And the uh, magnetic moment scales down uh, to the so-called nuclear magneton value. The nuclear magneton is just the proportional, the uh, scaled value of the magnetic moment. Uh, now the experimental data, as you can see from the spherical radius, it matches. For the other two numbers, it's same order of magnitude, but, but doesn't really match. There is a factor of four here and factor of almost three here. So these mismatches mean that the proton is not just a scaled positron, uh, we, we have to consider another structure. Okay, now there is experimental indications and you can see a reference article here already more than 20 years ago that uh, nucleons, they have actually a toroidal or anapole magnetic moment. So, so if you have a structure which has a toroidal magnetic moment inside, well, it's logical thought to, to think of it as a toroidal structure. So, so this very you know, simple thought inspired us to consider the proton to have a toroidal structure. And uh, that's why in our article, we consider the proton to have a toroidal uh, Zitterbewegung that's illustrated here. So 
So remember that in the electron, zeta bewegung was a simple circle. And here the zeta bewegung is along the surface of a, of a torus. And there are actually two ways to construct this model. One is a rotating heavy positron uh, with a single magnetic flux. So you imagine a positron, heavy positron being here, and then it rotates around, it creates a structure like that. The other way to construct this model is to say that uh, the positron and proton are topologically different. And we consider the proton to be a three tor particle with a distinct magnetic flux in the poloidal and in the toroidal direction. So in the article that we have, we consider both of these options and then we calculate the corresponding numbers. So for the first option, the uh, rotating uh, positron model, we get the uh, spherical charge radius being this before mentioned value that matches, uh, poloidal radius 0 0.21 femtometer and toroidal radius uh, about 0 0.6 femtometer and the magnetic moment we take as an input parameter. Okay, in the other example, the three tor model, we get the spherical radius charge radius with the experimental matching number, poloidal radius 0 0.46 femtometer and toroidal radius 0 0.83 femtometer. And uh, these numbers are actually really nicely matching the experimental values. And again, we take the magnetic moment as input parameter. And I know that I have now a revision in progress that will be published in the future where uh, we calculate the magnetic moment as well. So all of these parameters will be calculated and they seem to be matching experiment. So that um, somehow is a good sign that we might be on the right track with the proton model. Okay, now let's consider uh, how the actual proton motion looks like in the hydrogen, keeping in mind that as any particle, the proton also has a wave function, but it's much smaller. And it's well known that in the hydrogen, it's actually electron is not moving around exactly around the proton, but the electron and proton move around their respective center of masses, like a sun and planets. And this fact that they move around their center of masses is actually experimentally measured in the hydrogen readback constant value. And uh, from the electron-proton mass ratio, it follows that the Bohr radius of the proton's orbit is about 28 femtometers. So what we can see here, and you can you have to use a bit your imagination, is that the proton charge now moves along a three tor trajectory. So it has its poloidal circle, then the toroidal zeta bewegung circle, and finally the Bohr orbit uh, uh, circle. And these uh, three toroidal structures are are embedded together and. Um, and we can see that uh, nature is like the big old game. This is, this is really how real particles are, are structured. So, so those who, who made that experiment, maybe they did not know, but, but their experiment exactly reflects how, how elementary particles uh, uh, move in reality. Uh, <clears throat> okay, then uh, last question one could ask, what does this all imply for the neutron? Well, if we consider uh, proton to be a single particle, it automatically means that the neutron-proton difference is the presence of a negative elementary charge in the neutron. Okay, we are not the first ones to think of that. Many people have thought of it and shared this view, including Bob and I think many in the audience. But <clears throat> again, the big question is uh, uh, what it precisely means in terms of structure. And to explore this, I use again quantum scattering and uh, by analyzing quantum scattering, I came to the conclusion that the radius of neutrons negative charge is 0 0.4 femtometers. These details will be described in a future publication. But uh, graphically, here you see the proton structure I explained before. And the neutron is the same as a proton, except that you have this relatively large uh, negative charge that's locked inside this toroidal structure. And uh, these two charges together create the neutron. 
Uh, now, please keep in mind that although neutron has two charges, these two charges have overlapping magnetic fields. And even though it has two elementary charges, for practical purposes, it behaves like a single particle. And in fact, uh, the more you study these uh, topics, the more you realize that the line between a, a single particle and multiparticle is a bit hazy. Uh, it's not always so easy to determine when you, where you have the limit between one particle structure or two particle structures. And in fact, this has been the topic of last year's Nobel Prize in Physics, the so-called electron-electron entanglement. And what electron-electron entanglement means is that in some sense, the two electrons that share the same orbit are in some sense one particle and they behave entangled as a single particle, even if they are separated. So something a bit similar, I believe, in the neutron, you have uh, two charges, but these two charges together form a single particle that eventually decays into a proton and an electron. Okay. And uh, here are proton-related works. So we just published the article together with Giorgio Vassalo called The Proton and Occam's Razor. Uh, it's in this uh, journal of physics published, so you can search it uh, in Google. And uh, actually the publication of uh, this uh, article has been the uh, inspiration that inspired Bob to invite us to this presentation. So thank you for inviting us. And the forthcoming articles will uh, uh, go more into the proton and neutron structure and they will be titled, what is the proton made of and what is the neutron made of? I think this is my last slide. So thank you for attention. And uh, if any questions, then, then they are welcome. Thank you very much, Andras. OK, so I've got at least one question here on the Zoom chat by Stephen B. Halls. And he's saying, is Zita B. Wengang motion just the orbit circle around the proton, including the slinky-like helix, or is it? an embedded property of the electron itself, I assume. Yeah, yeah, it is the property of the electron itself. So let's go back to that uh, uh, slide. So the so the zeta bewegung motion is uh, this uh, uh, toroidal motion, uh, this circular motion that you see here. Uh, I hope you see my my mouse. So, so this blue uh, cork-like line is the uh, is the zeta bewegung motion. And uh, you can also see here in the illustration, two electrons with two energies. So the more fast the electron moves, the more the zeta bewegung cork is uh, like a spring pulled, pulled out. And the more slow it moves, the more it's compressed together like, like a spring again. Uh, and the orbital motion is the, is the white, white circle. So, so this uh, uh, blue circle and white circle is what... Uh, uh, I refer to as the tutor uh, structure. And remember, the zeta bewegung is the blue cork, and that gives the electron spin. Okay, I'm just seeing if there's any questions on YouTube. We have nearly 50 followers on YouTube at the moment, mm -hmm. and I don't quite know how many we got. We got uh, 14 participants in the room here. There are some across the two. Okay, so. Um, I've got some general questions that are not regarding your presentation. Do people want to ask questions in the um, Zoom call? If you want to ha raise your hand, if anyone wants to raise your hands, you go down to the bottom, you go click on reactions and uh, you click raise hand. Okay, Stephen, do you want to take the floor, please? Okay, uh, I was referring to the um, paper in two, 2023. Uh, darn it, I've just lost my graphic. There we go. I, I was just wondering about, is B0 showing on my screen there? Okay, do you, do the you want to precession share your angle? Do you want okay, to share your moment, I, I stopped sharing. And, and then... So, uh, Stephen, do you want to share your screen? Um, I can... Maybe try to figure that out. Hang Down on. Down the bottom, click on share screen and choose the screen that you have.
Are you seeing that now? I'm seeing something shared. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So this is from uh, Andres 2023 paper. There's a black arrow that's pointing at LP and a blue arrow pointing at BE. Is that a precession angle of 60 degrees? Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And this, this uh, figure uh, illustrates how uh, nuclear magnetic resonance technology works. And that is a, a sort of a fixed thing that's always at 60 degrees? Yeah, yeah, that is one uh, property of nature that in quantum mechanics, this comes out to be always 60 degrees. Thank you. I didn't know that. That's wonderful. <laughs> could, could, you, could you explain why that interests you, Stephen, about your background? My background? Yeah. Well, um, I need to look for angles found in symbolism, and I had a career as a radiologist with MRI. So I know some of this physics, but we're relearning it relearning it all properly now <laughs> thank you very much for your question is is that all you wanted to ask yes okay so if you can mute unshare your screen and then i will invite chris to make a question oh so get down the bottom again go to share screen and go stop sharing or it might be on the top of your thing it says the top there's like a green area and you can go stop sharing on the zoom interface there we go. Thank you. Right, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Wanna... Cheers. Do you want to take the mic there, Chris? Hi. Hey, Andras. Thanks very much. Hi. Hopefully um, you can hear me. Um, so I've had your book for a while and um, just it's taken me a long time to basically go through it. But um, one of the things I'm interested in is looking at uh, the neutrino um physics and especially how they wrap themselves up in the same way as what you've described um the electron and the um, protons um and the data seems to fit really well with um the massive um neutrinos that parker models looked at and to the point where the um neutrino charge radius comes out like right inside the the bracket of the measured um charge radius for like a 23 um ev neutrino so i think that's that's one really cool thing but my question to you is have you looked at um the vorton uh structures that freiberger um had talked about i think i'd sent you the um yeah, papers yeah, yeah, a while ago will. Yeah, exactly. You you uh, did send me some articles. You know, I'm in the process of of reading them. And uh, well, to uh, to answer a question, I you know answer a bit similar way how I answered in our email uh, exchange that uh, you know although uh, I stated uh, that uh, from my perspective, what physicists normally call uh, neutrinos they are these uh, trivial longitudinal waves, it, it does not mean that those waves could not create in turn uh, particles. And, and this is um, you know, very similar how you have a, a ordinary transversal wave you know, whose uh, transversal formation is well known. Well, it's, uh, it just boringly travels in flat space time without anything happening to it. But once it uh, travels close enough to a nucleus where uh, you have a strong electric field, then it's, it suddenly can create an electron-positron pair. So the trivial solution becomes an electron-positron pair. And uh, I imagine that the same thing could happen to longitudinal wave. You have a trivial solution traveling at the speed of light and close enough to an atom, it, uh, it could create some, some Particle pairs, which uh, you can you can call neutrino associated particles, if if you wish. But yeah, but these yeah, particles, 100%. you know, I have not studied these. Uh, who knows what particles they are? Yeah, and the other thing about that is, um, if you look at take the longitudinal neutrinos, um, if you look at a maximally dispersed. Uh, wave function, so the cosmic neutrino background, then the self interactions will be um, like an Aharonov bomb 
of both electric and magnetic um, types, which is essentially uh, a graviton. Um, is is if I'm if I'm tracking what Bob McElrath is saying, like that, it's all still consistent. Um, so that's cool as well. Uh, but the point I wanted to bring up about the vortons is that um, Gilroad had this stability um, criteria where, so it's not um, the power exclusion principle that defines what sort of quantizations are allowable now anymore. It's scale invariant, but you need to essentially grow the charge. You need to input charge to be able to grow uh, these Wharton structures. Um, so I can drop a link to that um, Gilroad paper. Chris, can I just ask you, for the, for the purpose of people that don't know what a Vorton is, um, just just synthesize that with other things that we're talking about. It, 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 it's um, yep. Freiberger's conceptual <clears throat> uh, hook, really, isn't it? It is, but it's, it's really topologically... Um, the same as what we're looking at. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, a, that's, it's another that's name. The main point I want to make is topologically the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And more importantly, it's the um, generalized Maxwell equations that underlie it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it will be interesting to to look into it uh, further. So, so I, I will look forward to reading it. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Andras. Thanks, Chris, for your question. Right, before I go on to uh, break the limits question, I have a question from Bob and Anne on YouTube and uh, that collective are asking, how does the presenter, that's you, Andreas, uh, define a field? Uh, how we define the field? Yes. Yeah, yeah well, in, in our definition, it's the space-time derivative of the four potential. So, so for us, uh, in our work, this electromagnetic four potential is the, uh, let's say, fun, uh, foundational object. And you take the space-time uh, derivative of the four potential, and that uh, uh, then defines the field. Uh, you know, I, I can already see that then the question becomes, you know, what is the four potential? <laughs> okay, well, the four potential is a starting mathematical object. And... Um, no, I, I don't say that this is the ultimate truth. So this is uh, how we understand it today. And uh, I actually do envision that at some point in the future, this uh, four potential will be uh, explained perhaps in terms of space-time curvature, because I, I can uh, imagine that in the future, perhaps everything will be explained in terms of space-time curvature, and all these potentials and fields will be seen as, you know, different deformations of the space-time and space-time waves traveling, meaning that we are looking at the ripples of space-time itself. I can, uh, I can imagine that, but that will be probably twenty-second century physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't know whether that answered your question, Bob and Anne, but thank you for it. Um, so, uh, uh, break the limit. Would you like to take the microphone? Yes, thank you very much. Hopefully I'm coming through okay. Um, actually, it's perfect that you went right in two questions ago into positron electron pair separation or spontaneous generation. And my question is about the energy requirements for when we see a spontaneous uh, generation of a positron electron pair flying apart at 180 degrees to each other after they've absorbed 1022 kiloelectron volts equivalent photonic energy. What you're presenting here is is a really fascinating model that um and by the way, fantastic presentation. Huge, yeah. huge salutes to you for an amazing, you know, trip through the mind space of what these particles might actually be and how they're structured on that scale. It finally kind of makes sense why these evos tend to take the shapes they do and why electrons can cluster together after what you presented today, because if the very shape of your particle is effectively a tiny little conduit for this larger structure. So what I'm wondering is, does the photonic energy of our input photon beams, each 511 kiloelectron volts, actually get wrapped up on themselves to then become the physical particles we know as the positron and the electron? Or is that energy absorbed in separating two particles which already exist? 
no, it is the first one. So, so I believe that uh, you you start uh, from this uh, wave, which is just electrical and magnetic uh, uh, fields in a in a trivial wave solution, and then the curved space time makes them curve uh, into uh, particle antiparticle pairs. So it is uh, uh, really just a wave that was there and the wave becomes uh, what we see as electron and, and positron. There was no particle before. That is remarkable. And then may I ask a follow-up question? In terms of how we generally would, would generate a spontaneous positron-electron pair, we would oftentimes use matter to initiate this process by sending two photon beams in extremely close proximity to some physical particle. Yes. Is there a particular reason for why maybe the... Uh, temporal compression or the higher stress energy density surrounding that particle would assist in this process? Yeah, I suspect, I'm not a specialist in this, but I suspect it's the uh, curve, the space time around the particle, because the more, uh, the more close you are to the particle, uh, you have a very high uh, uh, electric uh, field close to a charged particle, but uh, this high uh, field, high electric field, uh, you can also understand as a curve the space time, and right? A compression in epsilon of the variables. Yes, yes. I think it's this, this uh, curvature uh, that is responsible for the process. Thank you so much for answering the questions. That was perfect. Okay, welcome. Okay, um, Cosmic Dave, did you want to ans ask your question directly, or do you want me to do it for you? I'm I'm looking at you're in you're in both places, so. <laughs> You can take the mic. Do you want to take the mic? Okay. I will ask it for you. So, Cosmic Dave, is he going to ask? Okay. Okay, <laughs> he's asked me to. Right, so he says, uh, Do you think that consciousness can influence these fields? And is there something more fundamental behind wave collapse? Oh, but this, this question, unfortunately, I cannot... Uh answer uh, i don't know and uh, you know the one one reason why i decided to study physics and not biology because i thought biology is just too complicated for me and uh, i stick with with simple electrons that maybe we can understand <laughs> <laughs> okay. very good answer yes <laughs> stay in your lane <laughs> good okay all right so um and uh, he he his view is in reply uh, Personally, he thinks they can be affected. Okay, so there we have it. So, d okay, so Gerald, uh, do you want to take the floor? Hello. Uh, I don't really have a question, so for that, I apologize. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for your work. You're you're kind of laying the foundation of um, how I'm going to explain some of the work that I've been doing with geometrical coils, and I just, I love it. I wanted to say thank you. That's all. Okay. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. That's very kind of you. Right. So I'm just going to see if there's any. Right. Um, what we might do is see if Pavel has got his speaker up. Uh, Pavel, have you managed to get a microphone working there? And in the meantime, I'm going to pause on YouTube. So you're going to get a hold frame and I'm going to get some comments up. Um, and what will happen is... If I can get Pavel on, then he will speak. If not, I will just do a quick overview of some of his presentations. Now, my my you all know my jig is I promise to do this whole process without actually ever showing you an equation. I, I fall flat when I started talking about the bagel game, but I st I I did it more on a conceptual basis. It's about as far as I got. Um, so I don't mind people like Andres stepping in and Pavel stepping in to do equations because that means I can stick to my my lane as well on on the the visual and and and, and uh, observational science. Um, but uh, yeah, I I will just show you some things that he's observed. I've already identified uh, certain things that uh, Andres has spoke about today that is in Pavel's models and other things that you've asked questions on. Um, which are potentially different between the two. And if we can't get Pavel on today uh, speaking, I will ask him to join me here in this room because he's only about an hour away. And uh, we'll do another session with his 
presentations and hopefully Andras can come back during that presentation and uh, have uh, some questions for him. Okay, and he'll have some time, I guess, to evaluate his work. All right, so for those on YouTube, I'm just going to check there's no more questions here. Um, okay, and anyone in the room want to ask another question of Andres before I try and do this partial switch over? Okay, Stephen's just again wanting to say your presentations are great. Uh, and and had more and you had more information in your presentation he said Stephen uh, than you gave in your 2023 paper so he appreciates the extra context there so thank you for that okay right so I'm gonna there's gonna be a pause okay so actually Conrad Patterson is asking do you have a website uh, no we don't uh, don't have a website you need to fix that <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, you know, some of you, some of you know that uh, I'm working part uh, in the of the Clean HME project. So, so the Clean HME project does have a website, cleanhme.eu, and uh, some of the news uh, I, I post there on among the Clean HME news. Okay, so that's on one of the EU-funded projects. Yes. 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 It's cleanhme.eu. I, I put it in the chat. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do this try attempted switch over now. So it will go quiet on YouTube. Conrad Patterson says thank you for the answer.
So uh, <laughs> we may have lost um, Pavel, in which case I will I'll try and get him uh, on in in my studio here uh, in the future presentation to do his work. Um, in the meantime, just to see if he's rebooting his computer, Stephen has put on the frame there a group of shots of the formation of a plasmac, Paul Collock's concept for the formation of ball lightning, where you get a discharge with helicity and it causes a kink instability or a series of them and then these tear off and the current that flows around one of the loops uh, adds to the current of the next one merging with it until you get a large torus with a very intense current in there and you have a separatrix around the outside uh, and uh, uh, it becomes a self-organized um, structure. I actually don't believe it works like this and actually one of the original authors on one of his papers wrote on one of my YouTube presentations that I gave a few years ago, um, three days ago or two days ago, to say that actually the, the elongated version was actually a camera artifact and he's one of the authors so there we go. Um, I actually think it does do kink instabilities but what we have shown and I showed you at the start of this presentation was that you end up getting these twisted uh, pair structure coming out which has a closed loop at the top and we actually took that in David Butilia's experiments we literally showed that and I think what happens is it twists through like 90 degrees and it there's there's a uh, what Jay Roth calls um, it's a kind of like a a pinch or a bulge instability uh, and that causes the pinching off similar to what occurs in the original work by Bostick and they're actually 90 degrees and they then lock on to the magnetic field with their own poloidal magnetic field around the original loop and then these are just made and made and made and made and you end up with a tor of tor and as more energy is put in through helicity the, the same thing occurs on the sub tors so I think you end up with a fractal toral structure being made um, but I'll, I'll do that in a in separate presentation so I think that's probably enough time to see if okay so we're not going to get Pavel back so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share um, his website and a couple of presentate a couple of his um, presentations his uh, PDFs and then we will do a separate session another week um, of this so uh, of his work specifically so I'm going to share that now for the people you can see it now in YouTube but I'm going to share it for the benefit of those on zoom okay so so for those on zoom can they see what I'm looking at now yes okay great so this is Pavel Ozmir uh, he it was um, associated with uh, a couple of universities here in the Czech Republic, predominantly the Technical University here in Brno, where I live. And he has been very much onto this toroidal structure of matter for a good proportion of his life. And you can see various different things that you might identify with, with this uh, uh, vortex here and so forth. And he actually has a, a, a ring model of atoms and he's actually producing a kid's toy where like like um, the sticks or Lego you can join these things together to learn about his particular model of the atom. And on his website, so this is his main, uh, if I actually go here, no not that, <laughs> um, on his, uh, uh, maybe just go to the root here. Um, you can see here is a professor of computer science at Brno University of Technology and um, that's where he's at and you can see these toroidal interacting structures here and some very nice graphics I think some of these graphics were done by another Czech person called Pavel Werner but he has this link here called publications here and if we click on that 
you can see a whole series of publications going back to uh, when is it uh, this one's uh, 2009 and we're gonna have a look at quick look at some of these but I'm gonna leave the equations and that side of the discussion to him when he's about at another time um, and I don't know which one I'm going to look at here. It's called Vortex Ring Fractal Structure of Atom and Molecule. So this is, I think, a later paper, paper of his. And and you'll see some of the other discussions uh, similar to what we have been discussing about the history of, of vortex uh, matter organizations thinking for like the, the, the substructure of matter. Anyway, he says, this chapter is an attempt to attain a new and profound model of nature's structure using what he calls the vortex ring fractal theory, VRFT. Scientists have been trying to explain some phenomena in nature and that have uh, not been explained so far. The aim of this paper is to uh, is the vortex uh, ring fractal modeling of elements in Mendeleev's periodic table, which is not in contradiction to the known laws of nature. We would like to find some acceptable structure model of hydrogen as a vortex fractal coil structure. This is basically what uh, similar to what Andres was discussing uh, of the proton and a vortex fractal ring structure of the electron. So this is kind of how I view the electron. It's a vortex fractal ring. So this is why uh, Pavel was um, his work was forwarded to me when we found these structures and their imprints and, and the physical manifestation of them um, last year. Uh, so this is different to um, uh, Andras's model, but my view on, uh, ha if you go back to my original presentation, I was saying that the Zitterbibergang um, motion is because each of the vortex fractal rings is 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 self-similar and it kind of like moves things around it and around it so it goes up and around and if you think of that in a fractal nature you end up with the zitter b gang motion around it of something <laughs> and is that, is that the the uh that's, a, that's the proper German pronunciation I, I can't say it but thank you for correcting me i'm gonna <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Okay. Oh, this you've got you've got the motion on your uh, coil there. That's very nice. So, Gerald is for those on YouTube. Gerald is uh, showing. Right, I'm going to put Gerald up here so you can see him. He's showing a image of his coil here. So he's actually building something with that kind of electrical current flowing through it, and he's got a whole bunch of coils. Wow. You are the coil master, I have to say, Gerald. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Do you want a section at the end and, and show these off full screen? I think that would that would be nice. Yeah, okay, we'll do that, all right. So, um, yeah, so I, I think there is a, a way to rationalize the thinking of um, Andras et al. and, and uh, Giorgio Vassello um, with the vortex ring, uh, vortex, vortex fractal ring structure of the electron. And in fact, it's actually something similar is done by uh, Pavel Smira on his website. In fact, if you, I think maybe I can show you, uh, is it here? No, it, it is on his publications page. This is how I kind of imagined it. He's actually got the fractal structure here, his interpretation. This was done by Pavel Werner. And you can see he's actually done the helical movement going round. Uh, as a shift from one to the next to the next to the next so it's it it's not quite showing how i imagined it in my head and described it in 2020 but it's it's pretty close anyway so back to his work and you can i recommend you go and have a look at his site and so for that, those that want to know it's pavel uh, that's p-a-v-e-l-o-s-m-e-r-a dot c-z and you can get to his papers um uh, so he he works out the spin of the electron, and he has the old classical sphere model here, and and this orbiting thing going on here. He says there's a, a relationship between the proton and electron here uh, uh, through their magnetic lines, and he talks about how the magnetic lines are formed, uh, and so on. So it's a lot of calculations in here, and this is the, the sort of thing that it would be interesting to see uh, what. And Andras's view is of these things, um, and and here we go. This is this is the motion here, 
leading to that uh, spin of the uh, positron or the electron respectively um, and if you go down here you can see here the vortex fractal structure of the proton so he's got the coils and then they're offset like this and it actually extends further than that um, when we go down here this is the electron so in his model he goes further than I went in terms of using the fractal model to explain properties of the electron I haven't verified what he's done here but it kind of makes sense so someone asked what causes the the magnetic vector to be orthogonal to the electrical vector well he's actually got that in here and he's saying the the minus four electron uh, tor subtor structure is the electric line and orthogonal to that is the minus three uh, uh, fractal tor subtor structure and that causes the uh, uh, magnetic line okay so you've got the overall e minus electron structure here which is the whole thing and then the 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 minus one is this level which is the sub electron and then here you've got the minus two which is the sub sub electron okay and then he doesn't he, he's basically doing these to say like if you can imagine that these rings are sub substructures of substructures so um, and if you can imagine that this goes ad down ad infinitum, then the fine resolution of that, if something was traveling around this, as I was describing earlier, it would end up with that thing in German that I can't say, and we're going to call it Zitter Beaver Gang. <laughs> if, you, if you can imagine. <laughs> All right. So I, I want to Andres's opinion on that. Uh, like, this is how I imagined it in, in my my head, and I didn't realize there was a, someone out already out there that had thought about this. Is, is there any way you can think that that might be rational? And it comes down to what is field, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, the first comment is that um, uh, the charges, they have to move at the uh, speed of light. Uh, I'm not sure what these... Uh, 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 whether the charge is on the on these rings or where exactly is the charge but uh, uh, from our perspective you know, wherever the charge is electric charges are actually located they they have to move at the speed of light creating the the zeta bewegung okay so that that's a that first question for him uh, i guess um uh, so uh, that's that's a great question for him Okay, so he has this concept of the electric field and uh, how they fit in, what electric rays are, and so on. So it's very, very detailed that the level he's gone down to physically explain these things, whether they're right or wrong. Um, I think it would be easier to understand when he's talked through how he sees things. Um, and so, uh, and again, he we see this number cropping up here, <laughs> which... Uh, uh, we were talking about earlier with Andres, and uh, again, it, his his model explains the observable data that he has selected. You know, we've got 0.89 here, and and so on. So, um, very similar things going on. Now, with these structures, he then goes on to show the very structures uh, as the other author did that I started out by showing here, and he actually shows down here that the the proton is a fractal coil so you have a number of t windings going around but he's then taken uh, uh, two of these windings here and you can see that the two of the windings there actually have a coil around there and then they've got a coil around so he's he's applying the same principle to that and i guess it's it's like at some point how, how far do you need to reduce it to explain the the observables and i think andres where you're coming from is you're stopping short of considering any fractal level below what's necessary to explain the data yeah yeah so the the level where i stop is what we get from quantum scattering right so so for me the quantum scattering is the fun uh, the the radius that is given by the quantum scattering is the fundamental level at which i stop that, yeah that's so you're, you're, you're looking at the radius that's basically across this structure here uh, no, no, no. Uh, I, I would say the, the radius that uh, is inside the line. It, so, it's, so the, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so or you can you can consider it as the thickness of the line, basically. Right, okay. Okay, excellent. So, 
again, that's something that would be nice to rationalise between your work and his and, and where uh, uh, there, there may be some agreement or disagreement. Okay, so uh, that's one paper. Um, uh, there's a, this one's uh, got a little bit more graphics here. This is Vortex Fractal, uh, fractal Ring Model of Hydrogen Atom. This paper is an attempt to attain a better model of nature's structure using vortex ring fractal theory. The aim of this paper is the vortex ring fractal modeling of the hydrogen atom, which is not in contradiction to the known laws of nature. We'd like to find some acceptable quantum model of hydrogen atom as a levitating model with a ring structure of the proton and ring structure of the electron. Uh, it is known that the planetary model of hydrogen is not right. The quantum model is too abstract. Uh, our imagination is that the hydrogen atom is a levitation system of the ring proton so um, uh, and the ring electron. So he goes into the mass. Here you can see the torus structure of the, I guess, the electron or, or, or matter with spin a half. Okay, so that's how he's deriving that. And here he's looking at the um, fractal structure and, and how um, he, he describes what's going on with these uh, uh, graphics in other papers in detail. I'm not going to go into that right now, but this is his levitation model of what's going on. And you would argue that this maybe is not too dissimilar to what you're saying, except that the orbit is around the collective center of mass of these two particles. Yeah, and that, that's essentially... So, like, you know, the, the mass of the proton is vastly higher... 1840 or something right uh, bigger than the electron and so um, it, you could imagine that the center of rotation is actually quite close to the center of the proton right yes 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 and what I would like to also say for uh, for the uh, so that there is no misunderstanding that uh, this Bohr orbit that I showed is is just for illustration because uh, the the proper you know uh, solution of the wave function is is given by the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which has the orbital component and the radial component. So so you know I'm not uh, um, contradicting quantum mechanics in any way. Uh, I just want to emphasize that my illustration was a simplification, but there is also a radial oscillation. Okay. So I think what might be helpful is because I, I, I've done 3D animation since I was 16, um, that maybe I can work with both you and Pavel to come up with better visualizations, um, which, you know, if, if people can just understand things immediately uh, from, from an animation, I think it re really helps. Um, and, and okay, so great. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Andreas. Um, Again, we see this uh, structure reappearing here, and he talks about how that um, adds in all these uh, different constants and, and uh, the energy here um, and the spectrums and how that all fits in with his model uh, and so on. So it really would be great to have some people who are very interested in these aspects at this level uh, delving into this. So. Um, and that's why I think it's important, uh, Andres, that you have a chance to look at this in detail. So uh, the fractal dimension of an electron. And again, he's deriving the, the dimension of an electron here. So we would like to find a better and plausible structure of the electron as a torus and fractal structure. However, it is, an in, it is in contradiction with generally accepted knowledge where the electron has no structure. Actual properties of the electron cannot be explained by point-like models. This was the same point that was being made by Andras. Uh, this paper is an attempt to improve our previous calculations of the radius of the electron and its fractal dimensions. Uh, the vortex fractal theory could possibly help with explanation of what charge the electron, the proton, the electromagnetic field actually are. So we've got this image here, and then he's starting to break it down in the substructures here. This is uh, forces between two sub-electrons uh, inside the uh, electron here. And I, I'm reminded of a new scientist paper that I, I think it was from 2001. I have it over here. Um, <laughs> and I was going through my new scientist collection here. I think this is the one. One man thinks uh, the electron has been uh, split. If he's right, the curtain, it's curtains for quantum theory. So yes, this is uh, from, uh, no, it wasn't quite 2001. This is 14th of October 2000. So there we go. 
back in 2000, I thought, I need to save this document. <laughs> Maybe it'll be important one day. <laughs> and it actually describes how they did it. Uh, it's quite, quite a fascinating paper, actually. Um, so is there substructure? I don't know. But uh, uh, certainly uh, Pavel thinks there is. Okay. Um, eh, what else? So like I say, this is... Ah, so here we go. Um, example of ring structures. Uh, this is a hydrogen molecule. So you've got your two covalent bonds with your uh, electrons here and the protons. Now, what would you say was the... I mean, it doesn't really have an or orbit, does it, here in this case? Or how would the orbit be here, Andras, if this was uh, the model? Yeah, I, you know, in, in my case, uh, I just uh, see that the, the distribution of the electron is as described by the Schrodinger and Dirac equations. Right. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't see it as a specifically as a ring. <laughs> No. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, uh, because you, you, in your case, you're looking at the other more spatial aspects. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that so that you know, in our case, uh, the internal structure of the electron is uh, is this uh, ring, and the motion, the kinetic motion of the electron is along the axis of the ring. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, uh, when it forms a standing wave, it has this uh, spatial distribution in in all directions of the space, and 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 in the end, it's as defined by the Schrödinger equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, it, this is another point of uh, coherence between your two concepts here, um, which where he has the the proton here, but the electron is inside, uh, forming the vortex ring structure of the neutron. Uh, so here, this yes, is, that's 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 exactly the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Yeah, so uh, you know there there is a lot of commonality here. I mean, it it seems natural to think that um, to create a neutral charge particle, you would need to have these things where the charge was basically incident. Uh, um, so otherwise, they they would have some polarity to them, wouldn't they? So um, yeah, okay. So uh, that's great. We've got some consistency there. And again, that's that. And this was his latest paper that he sent me today. And I hope that this was going to be what he was talking through. But again, it's just uh, more detail and some closer up dry diagrams. But anyway, I encourage people to look at those. I encourage you particularly, Andres, to look at that. I'm going to unshare now. Um, I'm not the expert on his work. So I'm not the person to be uh, uh, taking questions on that. But I think it's definitely worth looking at. Um, okay, so um, I want to close out uh, and and take last questions. But firstly, I wanted to talk. Um, George Vassallo is watching, as far as I understand it. But he is. He says his English is not good. He was very, very uh, meek, and he he said that um, there's several things that he, you know, he considers that this shows. And I said that I would read it out. Um, so I'm actually going to copy it into a into a, a document here, and then we can we can look at it um, separately. So let me do this. Uh, okay. All right. So um, maybe I can make that bigger. Okay. All right. So um, he's saying that um, Occam's razor is a practical epistemological tool now i'm going to ask a question right at that point for 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 people that don't know what an epistemological tool is andres what does that mean yeah uh, i'm not a philosopher but uh <laughs> what uh, uh, what what on kermit's razor means in uh, plain english is that among uh, all the possible solutions or models the simplest one is probably the correct one yeah thank you um, he's then saying that um, uh, natural unit, sorry, space-time Clifford algebra CL3-1 open brackets capital R is the best mathematical tool in theoretical physics. What does that mean? Yeah, that, that just means that uh, what mathematicians call this uh, CL3-1 uh, uh, Clifford algebra is the uh, geometry of space-time. So, so if you work with geometry of space-time, then you know the mathematics, uh, you know, naturally follows the physics. Okay. 
Okay, then he says natural units greatly simplify the equation structure. Yeah, yeah. Natural units means that uh, instead of using SI units, we choose uh, speed of light equal one and uh, the uh, Heisenberg uh, constant h bar being also one. So h bar equals one and c equals one, um, you know, simplifies formulas. Okay. So electromagnetic four potential is real independent physical entity. Now, I think you tried to answer this before. Do you want to have another, another shot at it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, this I did not talk about in my presentation. Uh, so in, uh, in electromagnetism theory today, uh, the consensus idea is that uh, the electric fields and magnetic fields, the E and uh, B lines are the only measurable quantities and the potential is actually not measurable directly. You, you know, you can, you can integrate uh, electric field and then get potential, but you cannot measure potential directly. Uh, so now, uh, Giorgio's uh, opinion, and I share his opinion, is that um, actually elementary particles uh, do measure the potential because uh, the electron's mass and the proton's mass uh, is uh, related to their uh, potential. So in that sense, uh, we, uh, we say that it's not true that only electric and magnetic fields are measurable. The potential is also measurable and elementary particles uh, mass is actually a measure of their potential. We, we know it's real then because of the haranoff bohm effect. Yeah, that, that's another aspect of it, yes. Thank you, Laman, for the in, inter, <laughs> interjection there. Uh, did you want to extend your question there, Laman, or your comment? Well, it's just, uh, it's quite well known. That there's, uh, I'm not sure you can look it up. The Aronoff Bohm effect is a kind of a, a modification of the dual slit experiment, which shows that um, the, the vector potential is a real effect on the interference fringe so the result. Um, and it's, it's not the magnetic field that's affecting it, it's the vector potential, exactly. So it's it's only going to look up, but it is quite well known that. that that the vector potential, the, the, the four potential, is a real thing. It's not just electric and magnetic fields that can be detected. Thank you. Did you want to reply to that, Andros? No, no, that's fine. Okay. So uh, five, the four divergence of the four potential is a real scalar field that is not always zero, i.e. Lorenz Coulomb gauges are not always applicable do you have a comment for that yeah yeah this is what i i explained yeah. that uh, we we have a electromagnetic scalar field as a real physical entity six gageless maxwell equations reveals the nature of the electromagnetic sources as the four partial derivatives of the scalar field mm -hmm. it's again yeah, yeah it, it's again uh, the same so so gageless means that we don't uh, apply the electromagnetic gauge condition and briefly physicists uh, have uh, invented the so-called electromagnetic gauge to uh, force the scalar field to be zero and uh, we don't want to do that. Seven, d'Alembert, I'm probably saying that wrong but it sounds French because of camembert. <laughs> d'Alembert wave equation can be applied to both uh charge density and scalar field yeah it, it's just another way of saying that we have both uh scalar waves and uh, traditional transversal waves eight the electron can be modeled as a current ring generated by a massless charge that rotates at the speed of light yes yes i don't like here the word massless but <laughs> yeah this, this is the model i explained yeah so uh, when he's saying massless charge, the, 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 the actual mass is coming from the energy of the charge or the... No, no, the, the, that's why I don't say I don't like it because yeah. the, the mass is always comes from the uh, overall electromagnetic field. If the mass is not in a point, the mass is in, in all of the field in, in it, the space. It, I mean, it's the space-time distortion. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's so that you you should never think that mass is is in one point here or one point there. The the mass is distributed in all of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, the charge quantum E is always coupled to a magnetic flux quantum H over E. Yes. Yes, yes. So this I did not uh, talk about, but uh, you know, one question that uh, uh, comes up is uh, why are uh, uh, the electric uh, uh, charges quantized? Why don't we have a half elementary charge or, or, or one quarter elementary charge? And where we got with the theory so far is to demonstrate that uh, whatever the electric charge is, there is a corresponding uh, magnetic uh, flux and the uh, elementary charge and magnetic flux are related in such a way that if you have elementary charge E, then the corresponding flux is uh, H over E, uh, where, where H is uh, the, the Heisenberg constant. Uh, so, so in that sense, you, you explain why there is magnetic flux quantization, then you know why there is charge quantization and vice versa. Very good. At 10, the circular helicoidal trajectory of the electron's charge can be encoded using a single spinor of space-time algebra. That was your opening gambit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, um, it's just a way of saying that if you use uh, Clifford algebra, then uh, you don't get lost in the notation. You can express things simpler. Do, do you say spinner or spinor? Spinner. Spinner, okay. Spinner of space-time algebra. <laughs> okay, 11, the charge orbit radius is equal to the reduced Compton wavelength. Yeah, this is what I explained in the electron yeah. model. So uh, 12, the fine structure constant is equal to the ratio of charge radius and charge orbit radius. Yeah, yeah, this is the big, uh, uh, I'm only, you know, I have shown you these ratios that that have this you know, uh, you know amazing coincidence but in the end um, this is one uh, a thing that i would like to understand and we don't know yet where exactly this number 137 is coming from so that's that's still a puzzle <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> just thought. hold on sorry uh, who were you commenting alex sorry i'm just agreeing i think the constant that's the key we're going to when they pop up and we find out what they're really coming from. And that's what you're on the hunt for. Sorry, I just, I'm enthusiastic. <laughs> no worries, no worries, it's great. Uh, we, we, we like enthusiasts, enthusiasts get stuff done. <laughs> okay, right, so uh, uh, the electron massless charge has a mechanical momentum equal to the product of charge and the local value of the vector potential. Yes, yes. So that's, uh, that uh, comes from the electromagnetic theory that when you apply Maxwell's equation, you can uh, see that the uh, vector potential and this internal zeta bewegung momentum, uh, they, they are uh, related. They are strictly related. It's all right. You've, you've only got another uh, nine questions or comments by Giorgio and you'll have passed the test. So you're doing very well so far. <laughs> All right. It's, yeah, it shows that I have read the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're, you're the other one. Uh, right. right, 14. Using yeah. natural well, units, the electron's charge momentum is equal to its relativistic mass. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, so, so, so this uh, this means that in in natural units, that's why they are called called natural. You can uh, use mass, energy, momentum as uh, as equivalent measures. The electron momentum, not to be confused with the electron's charge momentum, is equal mm -hmm. to the product of charge for the component of local vector potential along the direction of electron motion. Yeah, this this I don't exactly get, but uh, in in the end, uh, one can calculate separately the internal momentum in this zeta bewegung motion and the kinetic momentum that's along the axis. So these are two separate momentum one can calculate. The electron momentum. Oh, sorry, I've said that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I wanted to ask it twice. Uh, it was so good. Uh, the the electron rest mass is equal to the component of charge mechanical momentum orthogonal to electron velocity vector. Yes, yes, exactly. So so it means that uh, you have uh, the uh, zeta bewegung momentum that I talked about. And the zeta bewegung momentum defines the mass of the particles. The more massive the particle is, the, the larger internal momentum it has, which is somehow logical that you know, the mass of the particle is expresses itself as the internal momentum of, of this electromagnetic field. 17, the value of electron relativistic mass is consistent with both special relativity and electromagnetism. Yes, yes, exactly. And that's uh, that we describe in the book. I think that's an uh, important result that uh, Einstein's relativistic mass formula you get automatically just by Lorentz transformation. So you look at this uh, electromagnetic field configuration, you do uh, Lorentz transformation, taking uh, Doppler effects into account, and uh, you get automatically the, the Einstein's mass formula. The value of electron relativistic mass I said that, haven't I? <laughs> I'm highlighting the wrong one right now. Uh, I'm tired. Uh, you bet you are too. Uh, the spin is the component of uh, free electron angular momentum along an external magnetic field. Yeah, this is um, uh, related to that question of the figure that we had with the, uh, remember the projection of this uh, um, uh, rotating uh, uh, proton angular momentum? And uh, there it was this 60 degree angle that we discussed. So he's talking about uh, the projected component that, that comes out to, uh, to H bar over two valence measure. All the electron models parameters that in natural units are dimensionless, pure numbers mm -hmm. are quantized. That's what you were talking about earlier, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is an observation that uh, when you choose natural units, you get uh, uh certain pure numbers uh such as the the alpha which defines the elementary charge uh you get uh, the angular momentum that's also quantized and uh, magnetic flux so so this kind of numbers which then become pure numbers such as magnetic flux uh, angular momentum elementary charge they uh, they seem to be quantized, and you know this is something that uh, we still have to investigate the deeper reason. Uh, but this this is not a coincidence, probably. I'm interested in this uh, comment here. The electron model is consistent with Aronhoff bomb equations. Yes. So so what? <laughs> what, what, what it so just what, what exactly is the question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, the electron model is consistent with the Broglie and Planck equations. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the, the Broglie uh, consistency I, I had a slide about where I derived that frequency. The electron model is consistent with an electromagnetic version or interpretation of Proker, Klein-Gordon, and Dirac equation. Yeah, well, I, I so agree. Basically, basically, he's arguing that this doesn't break a lot of physics, even some physics that's not an ordinary. Yeah, considered. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, uh, you know, understanding how uh, Dirac equation relates to our model is uh, not something one can explain in five minutes. It's described in our book. But, uh, you know, the big picture that I think I mentioned in my presentation that uh, many of these quantum mechanical laws uh, and formulas such as Dirac equation, Schrodinger equation, uh, we can actually derive it. And it, it doesn't have to be a postulate-based starting point for quantum mechanics. Uh, so we're not changing it. We're, we're just trying to explain, you know, where are these postulates coming from? So with all the things that it doesn't break, other, other than things like the particle isn't a point, mm -hmm. what do you think it does break? Uh, well, for for example, uh, so, somebody in the comments already described about electron clustering, that if you don't have the electron model, you cannot really have a handle on the on the electron clustering, 
but if you see that there is this toroidal structures that have uh, their magnetic fields, there can be magnetic attraction, then uh, then you can get these kind of solutions that you don't get from the uh, traditional point particle models. Absolutely, yes. Right, so we maybe got some questions here. Break the limit. Do you want to take the floor? Hey, thanks. Um, <laughs> Call me off guard here. I was uh, just having a conversation with David Cosmic. Definitely all on the right page. Um, give me a minute or so and let me just come back. Sorry. Okay. Well, so, well uh, does anyone else want to ask a question before we have a look at Gerald's um, coils? Okay. Well, thank you, Andras. I, I think you, you, you've only got stumped on one question. <laughs> Not really. So did, did I, I pass the test. <laughs> I think you, you got 21 out of 22. So I, a huge round of applause for uh, our main speaker today, our guest speaker, uh, Andres Kovacs. Uh, real huge hand of applause. Thank you. Full, full respect. You you definitely know this subject, so uh, that's a huge huge thumbs up. We're getting some silent thumbs up from those people. So really, thank you very very much. Uh, it's been really good. So uh, break the limit. Are you ready to ask your question? Nope. All right. Actually, I, I think uh, I think it was pretty well answered. Um, I was curious, though, just in this recent conversation, we're talking about this idea of synthesizing, basically synthesizing virtual particles by using these crossed product fields. And with this model, it seems like because we are just taking photonic energy, which we already have a cross product stress energy in, say, our, our mode of transport at velocity C, right? And those things, those photons, whatever they are, can become physical matter when they wrap up on each other because of the higher stress energy density becoming real particles. So we were wondering, you know, could we synthesize virtually large particles or sustain them temporarily? It seems almost like the original bagel coil experiments did exactly that. And, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering where the limits of this are in, in terms of what we could use for propulsion or gravity control. You know, just this isn't really a specific question. It's more just a general kind of overview of can we synthesize new types of synthetic matter to do really interesting things? Well, I, I don't know what Andres wants to say. But, and I'll... Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I really don't know what to answer specifically. I, I think that this uh, is very interesting topic to, to experiment with these big all uh, game type of uh, setups in uh, these fractal coils. You know, I, I did not do those kind of experiments. I'm doing other type of experiments myself, but if somebody is interested uh, in experimenting in that uh, that topic, that, that's, I think, is a very interesting subject. And um, from my point of view, ever since uh, in 2017 <laughs> or 2018, when I started taking past the part the first lion reactors um i viewed the things that were interacting and making these very highly defined boundary cuts into the fused quartz and other parts of the reactor um and they were exactly either in line with the solenoid b field or orthogonal to it exactly um it it they they struck me as macro quantum objects. Uh, I you're seeing something on observable with your own eyes scales that is a self similar structure of something that actually exists in nature at a much smaller level. Almost like when you're looking at crystallography and you're looking at diffraction patterns, you're actually seeing a a reflection of the the the, the structure that's very very small but big, like almost like a hologram type aspect whereas rather than rather than in a hologram you, you can see the whole hologram and you break it into little pieces and you can see the same hologram in the, in the, the little piece it's kind of the other way around and this is where uh Chukinov describes his ball lightning as a macro quantum object and ken shoulders um ultimately said that electron validium wasn't that and it wasn't charged clusters either what you ended up with at the end of the day is 
an exotic vacuum object. And a normal vacuum object, in my view, is a thing like an electron and a proton, right? <laughs> so if an ex what is an exotic vacuum object? Well, it's, it's like a particle that you've made. And then if you have a particle that is on a completely different wavelength to most other mass, then it, for me, it doesn't surprise me that that may have little interaction with ordinary matter because it's almost on a completely different frequency level, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the one comment I would like to add to that, that uh, I had uh, one uh, experiment uh, where I was seeing these uh, strange, almost macroscopic phenomena where I was uh, inspecting uh, uh, strange radiation tracks under microscope. And uh, so in that case, I had a, a CD disk where I used next to the reactor, a CD disk with the idea to uh, then observe the strange uh, tracks. And then when I was, uh, this CD disk were, were next to intense electric discharge. And then when I was looking at it under the microscope, the microscope uh, had LED lights that was lighting the surface. And what was very surprising is that uh, these tracks, they they did appear upon the interaction of the light. So 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 during while I was observing it, so that the point was that <clears throat> there was uh, you know some some uh, object structure that got stuck on the disk surface, whatever it was, and and when the light was uh, shining on it, then it made this. Uh, uh, Macroscopic tracks, and I could see these tracks moving under a microscope, and they had, you know, the size on the order of zero point one millimeter or something like that. So, uh, so you know, almost visible by eye, and that was that was very very strange, you know, what whatever it is that it does this. Well, uh, it's it's interesting you say that because I, I, I don't know, I haven't actually published the presentation yet, but this week's presentation with the Russian group is talking about work uh, where they are doing spark discharges inside a tube which has a wound uh, uh, optical fiber around this tube and they're passing laser light down it. And this was sprung off earlier work that was then expanded by Alexander Shishkin. And uh, Alexander Shishkin sh shared some comments on this with his presentation at the Russian conference last year where he was saying that these whatever they are, can be moved by laser light and by light in general. And he says that a lot of Lenner experiments where they're using light to stimulate the reactor could be because it's taking charge clusters out of the air and, and they're traveling along with the light beam and then they are aggregating at the impact point and that's triggering the effect. And it's not the, the laser energy per se and it's not the metal which is hydrogenated it's the actual interaction of the charge clusters that are being aggregated from the air and so this gives you a way where you could stimulate reaction by literally having a discharge and firing laser beams through it towards your target that you want to stimulate the Lenner reaction with so and this these kind of things have been done before and and so then then it gets to the point that Shishkin is saying that the charge clusters are basically static electricity. Well, what is static electricity? Well, it's the same thing as an EV in, in that because EVs are born out of discharges from static electricity. So, you know, th there's a lot of convergence in, in the thinking uh, uh, going on. And and so, uh, you know, what you're so what, what you were saying, um, uh, Andres, I think it, it kind of aligns li aligns with that. So imagine if you had a charge cluster in the, you know, the most basic form. You had a lot of static electricity on a particle, and then you're hitting it with the light. Is the LED light enough to cause the movement of that static electricity? Well, that's exactly what Shishkin is arguing that he's currently working on. He's actually said that previously. His thinking of using a laser actually came from previous work that where they were using an LED, and you know um, maybe an LED. The the lights typically like on this microscope I've got here, they they've got a whole bunch of LEDs around. That's that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's like that. Yeah. So the the LEDs could be interacting in the way that Shishkin is describing with the charge cluster and it's causing it to maybe get excited or destabilize or, or 
literally move away from the light. So, <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting finding. Thanks, thanks for sharing that with us. That's really, it, if you would, it would be great if you could send an image of that track that you captured. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will do that by by email after. Fantastic. To, to... I'd, I'd share it at the bottom of the blog. Okay, so we've got a um, uh, couple of comments here. Uh, what is it? Blah 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 blah. I oh, know they've moved off. I can't see them anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, that's that's way 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 way. Okay, all right. Well, I think it's 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 we're we're finished. We had about another half an hour to go, but I think that's probably enough for t this evening for everyone. If that's okay, <laughs> are, are you okay with that, Andres? Okay, fantastic. So I'd like to thank Andres again. A big clap again for Andres. Especially Thanks. as he passed the test. And yeah. <laughs> and just to close out, Gerald, do you want to go full screen and share and, and, and show some coils and what you think they should do and what you have seen them do? Sure. I'll do a quick show and tell because I have a presentation for this, but uh, I'm prepared to show it. So um, yeah, I just do a quick show and tell. This is the full that I ever made. This is a vortex coil. The design was by a man by the name of Mike Powers. My inspiration came from John Bendini for building these coils. This was my second coil. This one took roughly a day and a half to two days to one. It, it has 750 feet by firely wound. In other words, one way and then the other. So there's 750 feet on either side. And then I've showed you this one earlier. This one was wound with galvanized wire for a specific purpose. All these coils are vortex coils and they all have different purposes and different wine configurations. I built over 175 different coils, mapped out their geometries, their fields, what they do. This particular coil here, you can put 12 volts, uh, 12 watts into basically one amp. And I can light a 150 watt LED grow beam at about 90% its power, just on 12 watts through this coil. And then there's this one. And this one here is made out of two different types of metal. It's a copper and an aluminum that's been coated. And then this one here is the one that I use for electroculture. And as you can see, it has multiple layers of wines on the inside. This one was an interesting wrap, to say the least. And I'll show you one mildly bigger one, but very simple to see. And they're all based on geometrical form. And I do or would like um, more of an in-depth presentation, uh, please contact me, Bob, or... Uh, whenever you would like, and uh, I'll, I'll do a full presentation on what they do, how they're made. I've uh, written a book on how to build them, how to wire them, and the notes that I've gotten from the experiments in these devices, they've filled four binders. So there's a lot that I've done with them. I've done electroculture experiments, power generation, carbon capture, uh, magnetic confinement experiments, um, PMEMF healing, and, and one that um, I don't talk too much about, but there's a propulsion aspect to certain coils that I've built that I'll get into in the future, in depth by far. So that's my presentation. Awesome. Thank you for the time. All right. Well, let's, let's try and set that up. Uh, Stephen's got a question. Gerald, can you put a quartz crystal in the middle and make it react in some way? Um, that's not an experiment that I've done, to be honest with you. It's uh, definitely something that I can put on the list for the future. Okay, it, awesome. It... So, Gerald, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to call it a night, and uh, we'll have you on in your own session. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for everyone on uh, YouTube. And uh, I'll say, buenas noches, dobrodots. Good night. Thanks. Good night. See you guys. Good night.
It was awesome. Thanks so much for hosting. Can't wait to get into temporal mechanics in the future. That'll be a fun one. Yes, torsion mechanics is a beautiful thing. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. I'm going to call it off. Bye. Record.